Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back. CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black. The Eye on College Basketball Podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, please also do that. While you're here, let's get into it. The Big 12 was among the centerpieces of the sport this weekend. There were five games involving ranked teams. Two games featured a ranked team against another ranked team. The biggest was probably Kansas at Iowa State. Terrific. Final score, Cyclones 79, Jayhawks 75. T.J. Otzelberger guided Iowa State to a victory that pushed his program to 5-2 and two in the Big 12. And mm-hmm. then, and this was the interesting part, Used the beginning of his post-game press conference to very directly deny any and all allegations or suggestions that he or anybody else connected with his program had placed people behind Kansas State's bench earlier in the week, which it turned into our latest Big 12 controversy. Deadleg, mm-hmm. let's start there. Yeah. What did you make of Iowa State's win over Kansas? That was followed by T.J. Osterberger's direct denial that Iowa State basketball is a spying cousin of Michigan football. Yeah, people, good morning. Happy Sunday morning. little Sunday AM pod for you here. Thanks for everyone for hopping on live in real time. And if uh, you're getting to this at some point Sunday on your phone, we appreciate you. Hope you like uh, a little little twist on you there. Uh, We'll play that Otzelberger sound in just a second here. As for the game, um, when this was happening, I was in Providence. We will talk about a cool at least return after the break. No word from our partners yet. Um, I, I thought... The game and the result was not terribly surprising because Iowa State has made a habit of taking out ranked teams, top 10 teams in that building. And TJ Altsenberger has well established at this point a program that is going to be able to take on any team that walks into to Hilton and, and come out with the win. It's not going to happen every time, but it's going to happen more often than not. I, I focus more on ISU than KU right here in terms of how meaningful the result is. Although, I, you know, as I'm sure you might even have in your notes, GP, uh, Kansas now being four and three in Big 12 play is the first time ever they've gone four and three through seven games in Big 12 under Bill Self. So that is that is notable there. But Kansas now, uh, I think it's won, what, three of its past four games against KU after having lost seven in a row prior to that. Kansas has won seven straight games at home against ranked teams. And the twist in the game was that Iowa State hit 14 threes. And it was the most three pointers that Iowa State had made in a game in the past three seasons under, and this is since TJ Otzelberger got there. So they got a nice unexpected boost there. And um, having Curtis Jones go off in the second half, 13 points, four threes, excuse me, three threes, was uh, was was pretty impressive. Before we get to Ots- Otzelberger's comments, um, game was obviously on CBS. Uh, what was America's your- most watched network is a network of stars. Correct. Um, with Iron Eagle, the great Iron Eagle on the call. Actually, Nada, do you have that real quick? Uh, Iron Eagle has now, I think, called two games. He's now the primary, uh, the number one play-by-play guy for CBS, and he'll he'll be on the uh, the primary team, obviously, with Grant Hill and Raftery for the Final Four. Just a, a quick little, I saw this late on Saturday night on the timeline, and um, there's a fan who the past two broadcasts has has received us some camera love here. Eagle was all over it. Nada, if you got this, just play this uh, play this quick clip real quick here. Uh-oh. Bill Money just got teeth. Bill Self was screaming, and a technical has been called. All righty then. <laughs> I mean, if you're listening, you heard the all righty then. It's the reference to Jim Carrey. I don't know. I, this fan who's got one hell of a of a hair flow going on, <laughs> and he, he gets caught standing in the aisle eating something, and Ian Eagles perfectly timed all righty then made me crack up. The game before, he's 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 going over to Jerome Tang and the K-State coaching staff, you know, rubbing his head, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> So I don't know who this dude is, but he's ascending to stardom and aims right now. Uh, great stuff by uh, by by him, and and a star might be born there. What were your thoughts? It, well, um, first on him, I did notice that, and um, that is the type of thing he is now. The type of guy, like when he walks around today, somebody will stop him. 
I know. <laughs> he's, he will get he'll get recognized today as he's walking around campus or wherever you walk around uh, in Iowa on a on a Sunday. So yes, that was a nice moment. Ian is obviously terrific. Not just a, an incredible play by play guy, but a genuinely hilarious human being. Like he's funny off the mic. Yeah. So it should not be surprised that that he can be funny on the mic. Just, the timing was amazing. That's yeah. <laughs> um, by the way. The number we used in the final four and one on Friday, I believe, was Iowa State minus four. By tip, it was closer to Iowa State minus five. I know you were in Providence, so you might not have seen this. Yeah. Kevin McCullough, nothing three at the buzzer. Oh, really? Turned a seven point game into a four point game. So that flipped money uh, somewhere. Okay. Um, the most concern, there's nothing concerning about losing at Iowa State. Um, you know, not many people are going to win there this season. Um, th that place is Hilton magic for a reason. I often get stuck just off the top of my head. I'm like, yeah, man, the, of all the places I've never been to the pits, the one place I'd like to get to someday. And that is true. But then I watched yesterday and I'm just reminded the one, one of the places I've never been to that I would like to get to someday is, is Hilton Coliseum. It, it's just terrific. And has been that way for a, a long time predating uh, even when TJ was the head coach all the way back, and, and even before this, but obviously when TJ was on staff um, uh, as an assistant coach mm -hmm. under multiple coaches. Um, the so there's nothing concerning about losing at Iowa State and nothing concerning about losing a close game at Iowa State. Like, I don't think much differently about Kansas today than I did yesterday, but I am growing increasingly more concerned with Kansas because it, the same problems that have existed for maybe just the beginning of the season – continue to exist they they go away temporarily but they don't really go away did you notice how many bench points kansas had yesterday i i did not but i do know and lay it on us i did know that D dickinson had a huge game he had it, 20 points 15 boards four assists and i wasn't watching every minute because where i was in providence but i was trying to check in here and there and so i didn't realize it was uh it was don't tell me it was it zero two Okay, yeah, again, and this is, I think this might be the second game or third game in a row where that's been the case. They've only gotten one bucket. Two points from the bench, 73 points from the starters. Off the bench, El Marco Jackson, five star freshman, O of O, O points. Mm. What? Mm. Yeah. I, I ain't never seen a five star freshman take so few shots. Uh, I'm I mean, sure. sure I, I, have, Calip I, I don't know if Calipari let uh, Anthony Davis ever shoot. So we, this might <laughs> yes. not be on precedent. Yes. It was, it's Anthony Davis and El Marco Jackson. Fewest shots by a five-star freshman in the history of college basketball. I mean, zero for zero, zero points in eight minutes. Nick Timberlake, 0 of 3, zero points, seven minutes. When we made Kansas, or at least some of us, made Kansas number one in the preseason. Some, it was, some of us is correct, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> some of us. Others might have faded that opinion. Continue. When, when, when some of us had Kansas number one in the preseason, it was based on either, in probably both, but either, or Melico Jackson or Nick Timberlake being good. I thought both would be good. Neither's good. They both stink. Kansas I has five wrong. players. One more time. I was wrong. They have four starters who played at least 35 minutes yesterday and mm -hmm. no reserves who played more than eight. They really do have like a four or five player team. It's incredible. Yeah. Self said afterward, uh, I did catch this as well. And I, he, I don't disagree with him on this, but Big 12 fans will jump on this. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but Bill Self basically said that the meaning of winning a Big 12 regular season title now is diminished because it's not a round robin. That I think is objectively true. The Big 12 for a long time, you had to you got to play at home against everyone and you had to go on the road and play everyone. So it was true balance like what the Big East has right now. It's the only power conference for that is the case. But um Bill Self is not wrong about that. But ha Kansas having won almost every single regular season title since Bill Self got there and now you have the first season wherein you don't have a round robin schedule. Kansas is now off its "Quote unquote worst start," which it is its worst start, but they're still, you know, one above water, four and three in the toughest league in the in the country, and Kansas not on track to win the regular season championship. He just he said, you know, it it doesn't carry as much uh, weight, it doesn't or as much bearing as it has in the past. Um, that's not going to stop other fan bases from. Uh, from yeah, I, I I guess that's true by definition. Like I'm, it, I'm, it I'm is. 
Yeah, I think I guess if you look at the schedule, Parish, like the Big 12 did what it should have done. The schedule makers that like the projected top four or five teams, they almost all play each other twice. Now, some teams get they don't have to play against one versus the other. But like you check what Houston got, you check what uh, Texas and Oklahoma got as they're on their way out. They just have tougher projected schedules than some teams at the bottom. Yeah, well, like, okay, so one of the things um, because we've been in, you know, Brent Stover, my my best buddy and a host CBS Sports Network and. Big CBS. Sometimes I turn on Big CBS and their stove. Love to see it. I love to see it too. So he's a Kansas State alum, right? He was a he ran cross country at Kansas State. He's a Big Twelve student athlete. He was a competitive jogger in the Big Twelve. Mm-hmm. And so um, one of the things we had talked about, you know, Kansas State got off to a four and one start in the Big Twelve. Woohoo! Right? That's great. Well, did you look at who they beat? Their first five games in the Big Twelve were against Central Florida. West Virginia, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and Baylor. They played the three three of the the three worst teams in the Big Twelve were a part of Kansas State's first five games. Well, how'd they get off to a good start in the league? Well, they got to play the bad teams early. So if we can agree that the conference standings were shaped at least early in the Big Twelve season by strength of schedule, just who played who and who played them where then we should also be able to agree that at the end of this, it might also be shaped. In fact, almost certainly will be shaped by strength of schedule. It is possible the best team in the Big 12 won't win the Big 12, that the best team in the Big 12 might get a trophy because it played an easier schedule than the best, than what what most would perceive to be the best um, team in the Big 12. For instance, right now, who do you think is the best team in the Big 12? Every computer and human poll would tell you it's Houston. You yes. look at the Big 12 standings, it's Texas Tech. It is. Um, and let's let's get to Houston, Texas Tech. One quick thing. Let's at least let's let Otzelberger have his moment here. This is about 65 seconds or so. He opened his press conference after Iowa State got a huge win in what he said was the best environment he had ever experienced, ever, yesterday in the win over Kansas. But after what we mentioned on a previous show and obviously the reporting out of the uh, out by Kellis Robin at the K-State beat writer, um, it got noisy enough where the athletic director put out a statement uh, and then T.J. Otzelberger said this after the win on Saturday afternoon. It's incredibly disappointing um, that after such an awesome game and awesome environment and atmosphere that I even have to begin uh, by addressing um, something that happened you know, earlier this week, uh, the ludicrous, ludicrous rumors uh, earlier this week uh, that somehow we were trying to gain an advantage uh, looking into our opponent's huddles is an affront to our players, our fans, and to me. It's not who I am. It's not what our program is about. And I'm angry that someone would even make that suggestion. What is factual as one of their staff members cursed out one of our student managers who is mopping the floor under the basket. So let's put this to bed here and now. It didn't happen. It won't happen. And others need to be much more careful with their words moving forward. Kansas State, Iowa State do play each other twice this season. The return game for Iowa State just happens to be The regular season finale on March 9th, Iowa State at K-State. We've got a couple of uh, new rivalries that are that are bubbling up here. We'll get to the Providence one in just a few. Uh, But K-State, Iowa State, um, that's about as definitive as you can get. And I'll be quick on this because we got a lot to touch on here. Um, In talking with people around the sport in the past few days, uh, the overwhelming consensus is that it would so not be worth it to even try and do this because of the way that basketball is played, the game flow, the natural. And I think I even might've mentioned this on Friday show, the improvisational nature where coaches and teams will run sets and that, that might get blown up in two and a half seconds. And then you'll still have a freelance. And sometimes the freelance will lead you to a bucket more often than the play can. Don't get me wrong. Coaches and X and O schemes, they mean a lot. They mean a lot in college and really good coaches that can have a compound impact over the course of a season and in the course of a game. But, you know, I do believe Otzelberger when he said this because I just don't believe that it is remotely worth attempting to do because this is not football. But he opened his presser with it. It got loud enough where he felt compelled to do it. And uh, and so there you have. It. I loved it. I love like be direct. Go right at it. Yeah. You know, um, I 
I don't know. Like, like, you know. We talked about this on Friday, and I, at, as of Friday morning, I had not, I was not aware that this was a controversy. So you sort of surprised me with it. Like, did you hear what happened? And I'm like, no. And so then you tell me, and I said, I mean, maybe, I guess, but that seems crazy to me. Like, now's not the time. Like, with the whole Michigan thing being front and center, like, even if you were compelled to do something like that in basketball, now is not the time. So what I, I told you, um, hey, I don't know, but it seems crazy to me. And for then TJ to come out and so directly deny it, I thought was good. And I do agree with his point. I don't know who told the Wichita Eagle as a source that Kansas State's staff believed Iowa State had maybe put people behind their bench to use cell phones and then, you know, uh, 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 send information back to the Iowa State hub. I don't know who said that. But it, it, but if we uh, believe somebody on the staff did tell the Wichita newspaper that, I agree with TJ that somebody on the Kansas State staff should be more careful about making allegations like that. Like just because you see young people behind you on their phones, that doesn't mean that they're trying to gain an advantage as much as it could mean they're just young people with phones. Like, you know, I go to concerts all the time. There's often young people there. They are constantly pointing their phones at people. Mm -hmm. I was at Post Malone in Las Vegas for New Year's. Of course. All right. Um, everybody was pointing their phone at Post Malone. Were they trying to gain an advantage or were they just videoing Post <laughs> no Malone? One was trying to, I, I assure you no one was trying to gain an advantage on Post Malone. I think people were trying to gain an advantage on Post Malone. <laughs> That's uh, what that, I, that analogy really swerved into a place I wasn't expecting. I, I, and I was, I was dumbfounded by how many people in Las Vegas were trying to gain an advantage on Post Malone. <laughs> Curious to see that post Malone K State rematch later. A Kansas season. State yep. staffer told me, "I think, I think these people are trying to gain an advantage on post Malone on Posty right now." It just you can't. I don't think you can. This turned into a big story, and yeah. it appears it was about nothing, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, um, rematch end of the regular season. Let's can't let's wait. still let's still touch on the Big Twelve before we uh, before we whip around. I guess you mentioned. Uh, Houston, it is still number one in the net, has remained that way. And coincidentally enough, Kansas State, 74-52. Uh, Houston just dominated. Um, I don't know if there's really a big takeaway from that, other than they just remain the best ranked well, team in the country in terms of the metrics. Texas Tech is the <laughs> Texas Tech, though, and Grant McCaslin entering that National Coach of the Year conversation because that team maintains its spot atop the Big 12. 85-84 win over Oklahoma. Chance McMillan career best 27 points along with a career best eight rebounds and uh tech did not hit a did not miss a bucket down the stretch there going six for six to uh to clinch the game 11 and one in this past 12 oklahoma is going in the wrong direction still fine from a seed projection standpoint uh not as good as it was obviously two three weeks ago parish but now lost four of its last six games and uh texas tech man things are not only good right now um just one of those uh those trends they've broken they have won back-to-back -back road games against oklahoma for the first time in more than 25 years so mccaslin's doing a wonderful job and they have now moved into a very comfortable spot he is going to get into the tournament in year one and you and i did not project that to happen in our preseason prediction podcast what good team wins the most road games against other good teams that who that's who I think is going to be the Big Twelve champion. That's going to have to be the case. Um, and I can, I don't know if you know it right now. If you're setting me up, I don't know what the answer is right now in the Big Twelve specifically. It might be Tech, but it might be Houston. They those two right now seem best equipped. Now it's easy. To, like sometimes I, of course, it's you can say that right now because they're a combined ten and three, and they've proven it so far. Which isn't to say Kansas won't get together or Baylor might not be able to do it, but you're that's almost certainly going to wind up being true. If you can peel off the most road victories in this league, particularly when it's so good, you're going to set yourself up. Well, yeah. I'm looking at Houston right now, GP It actually just has one. It has one roadie right now in the big 12 because it got dropped at ISU and TCU. Right. Texas tech has a win at Texas and at Oklahoma. So we're still early. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're still early, but they played three road games. Texas tech has, and they've, and they played three road games against three good teams. That's yeah. my point. They ain't got like a West Virginia in there or an Oklahoma State in there. They've played at Texas, at Houston, at Oklahoma, and they're two and one in those games. That's tremendous. 
Um, can I ask you real quick? Uh, cause I didn't see any of this one. I didn't see any of it. Uh, but, and we had a, we had a, we had a number of OT games yesterday. So TCU beat Baylor one Oh five. Well, what, what, one thing real quick. I just, okay. I wanted to say about Houston, then we'll move on and I'll be okay. quick on it. Right. Um, I did do something on Sunday morning that I rarely do with the top 25 and one, and that's reshuffle the top five. Um, I had got trapped in a situation where I hit Houston fifth in the top 25 and one, and it was a direct byproduct of just, um, you know, they lost those, those two back-to-back road games at Iowa state and at, uh, was it TCU? Yeah. Houston. Yeah. So they lost those two road games at, at, at which point, and you know, they didn't schedule aggressively in the non-league for understandable reasons. They were moving from the AAC to the big 12 and you don't want to overdo it. Like I get it, but their non-league strength of schedule was like 157. According to the net, they didn't, build it took them a little longer to build a resume than it did to other elite teams based on schedule strength and then they lost those two road games so at that point i moved five teams in front of houston houston was down to six and since then since that day four of those five teams i moved ahead moved ahead of houston have not lost so i've just sort of kept houston behind them and so i you know you wake up on saturday and houston's fifth in the top 25 and one but that no longer makes sense. You know, at, at this point in the season, I am a big believer in resume over just about anything else. And Houston has in the past, since I dropped them to six and then they moved up to five, Houston in his past four games has added two quadrant one wins and two quadrant two wins. Simply put, I now think Houston clearly has a top three resume in the country. I jumped them over Tennessee and Carolina. My top five is now Purdue one, UConn two. Um, Houston three, uh, and then Tennessee and North Carolina coming in at four and five, but in flipped order, one Purdue, two UConn, three Houston, four Carolina and five Tennessee with Wisconsin sitting at sixth. TCU Baylor. Can you get, can you give me any, uh, rundown on, on this? Uh, the only thing I got for you is TCU. Keep an eye on this. Six of its seven big 12 games have been decided by five points or fewer. They're three and three in those games. Uh, triple OT win 105, 102 Baylor's first home loss of the season. Baylor's now actually lost three games in a row, but they lost a triple OT game. And then remember they lost at the buzzer against Texas last Saturday. I think we're just going to look up at the end of the season and we're going to have all these teams with really good seeds. And you're going to look back and scan back on the resume. Like, well, they had a three game loss here. Oh, that team. Look at that. They lost three out of four. I just think that kind of stuff is inevitable, but I uh, just teeing you up. Cause I didn't see, yeah. uh, I didn't see it, um, well, Jacoby Walter was not efficient to a 12 from the field. So he wasn't, uh, very good. And that's just like a, I mean, you watch college basketball right now. I mean, I live in a market where we're probably going to have a lottery pick because everybody's hurt and or suspended. Mm-hmm. Who do you even want? <laughs> I mean, who who's the can't miss NBA prospect in college basketball right now? Zach Eady. D- Dalton Connect. <laughs> Dalton Connect, yeah. <laughs> building toward an interesting one. Uh, I think Sam Vecini, if we can squeeze him on before the end of the episode, we'll get his opinion on this stuff, but uh, there's a lot to get to. I, yeah, think Sam, uh, uh, I think Sam would tell you that he thinks like the, um, the pool from like 20 to 60 is actually pretty intriguing this year, but in that, uh, that lottery range, there's still a lot to be figured out. And you're, you're going to notice that I think this year there's going to be a good uh, four or five guys from overseas that wind up going in the top. Six. And the, the other thing I noticed is that, Okay, so that, that Baylor game, there's some interesting stuff there. Just if you watch that game and you go, okay, this guy's uh, a candidate to be the number one pick, but I don't, I don't know. Would he be last year? Would he be next year? So you see that, and then you go, okay, Baylor is – where was Baylor ranked as of yesterday in the AP poll? I mean, so you look at it and you go, okay, Baylor is ranked 15th in the country. I had Baylor in the top 10, actually, as of yesterday morning. And a Baylor fan tweeted me and was like, I just don't know if we're really a top 10 team. And I say this all the time, but your perception of what a top 10 team is doesn't necessarily line up all the time with what a top 10 team actually is. You got to rank somebody eighth. And you got to rank somebody ninth, just like you got to take somebody first in a draft. Well, people don't realize you got to put twenty five teams into the top twenty five poll. They don't twenty six in the top twenty five and one. People don't. They don't know talk it. about it. They don't talk about it enough. Yeah. And so, like, as I was doing the top twenty five and one on Sunday morning, it's like I get to about seven, and I'm like, all right, now what? Really, this team is still in the top ten. I mean, I had there was a, a group of teams like eight, nine, ten, eleven in that range that all lost yesterday, and you start trying to reorganize it. And it's like, man, I don't know how good this team is, but I guess they're 11th based on the body of work. There just aren't that many 
There's a drop off inside the top 10 now, I believe. I guess that's my point. And Baylor is probably on the wrong side of that drop off. And then TCU, it feels like TCU is good. And they do have some big wins. Um, but TCU right now, even after yesterday, two and four in quadrant one, one and one in quadrant two. They're three and five, and the, they're two games below 500 in the first two quadrants. Now, four of the five losses are inside quadrant one. They've got nothing outside of the first two quadrants in terms of losses. But TCU, like, it, you, you watch them and you go, oh, man, that's another big win for TCU. Like, I think if you're a casual basketball fan, you look at TCU and you go, I can't imagine how they won't be ranked on Monday. And I think they probably – they might be ranked on a Monday. But if I just gave you blind resumes and said, hey, here's this team, you would not look at that and be impressed. Okay. One more from the Big 12. Uh, just an absolute thems situation all around. Credit to BYU getting a home win, 84-72. <laughs> Texas, by the way, this is because of this one year, this gap year, if you will. Like, Texas at BYU. Will Texas ever play at BYU ever again? <laughs> like, it's going to the SEC. But they had to go this year. <laughs> they took an L. And then – can we just can we stop being lames over the horns down stuff? The BYU fans not has got a photo of this thing right now. So you had, you know, you had this group of BYU fans right there in the front row in the pregame. They spell out horns down. All right. They get their act together. There's not, you know, the D isn't in the wrong place. The the person wearing the R isn't on the other side of the person wearing the N. They got it down. And then they make him take it off. And then Mark Pope in the post game goes, he basically like earnestly apologizes for it. Come on, people. This is like it's like borderline infuriating that people are taking this horns down stuff this seriously. It's them's behavior from BYU, obviously. obviously. It's them's behavior for Texas to continue to be like this. It's only going to get worse in the SEC. Of course, we had to mention it. Complete disappointment here. This, this, we're what 26, 27 minutes into the show. This felt like the fourth biggest story in the sport on Saturday. This horns down thing. This tweet you see here that Nada's got on the screen for those watching it went it got shared virally uh, as it should be completely ridiculous I hope every opposing fan base continues to horns down just live with it whatever what are we doing I would argue Texas being that upset about horns down is more of them behavior than BYU actually being a bunch of thems oh that is a major major accusation <laughs> I mean it sincerely that is a major accusation, particularly with the other school involved. Here. We've got to a point where we act like it's a racial slur. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Why is horns down offensive? <sighs> if it, what, it, it, you're ready for this, hey, is Duke sucks offensive? <laughs> uh, well, we're going to ban Duke sucks or D O O K Duke. Can't do that. Come That's on, offensive. Duke. Like, what are we – like, do you know how stupid it is that we have reached a point in society where college-age students can't say horns down? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, what are you talking about? I would be embarrassed if I were a Texas administrator or coach or player or student or fan who was that bothered by horns down. I don't know. Just It's one thing after another with this horns down stuff. <laughs> And, and, and you get ready to go to the SEC, and you're worried about what the BYU students are doing to you? Buddy, in the SEC, they will show up in shirts that say your mama's a whore. I can't believe that they made – that. I, I, my understanding is BYU made it made them take it off. Yeah, and they shouldn't have. You know what they should have said? What, Texas should have came to be – Texas should have come to BYU. Uh, when Tex Texas comes to BYU and says, hey, you got students wearing horns down T-shirts. We find that very offensive. You should make them change it. And what BYU should have done is then look at Texas and say, with all due respect, takes one to no one, but you're acting like a them. You know, someone in the chat, K2 Wills, this is a great point here. Is horns up offensive? If you can't do horns down, then you can't do horns up. All right? If it can't be this, then it can't be this. Okay? If it can't, if it can't be that, then it can't be this. Period. All right? Can't have it one way, but not the other. It's ridiculous that they made them take these shirts off. We had to obviously you, you drink. Make, uh, dude, so if, I would have, if I would have just thought about this for two minutes, I swear to God, I'd have showed up today in a horns down t-shirt. You know, at some point, we got to stand up and say this is outrageous. You know what? We might have to do it. And it's nothing against Texas. It's nothing against your players, your team, Rodney Terry. It's the whole the idea that this is an affront like Paris, like it's some sort of slur. What are we doing? If you if you don't want the down, you can't go horns up. Period. Okay, can't go horns up. Period. We're, we're going yeah, long. Just, just, months, by the way, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just just. I don't want to say horns down. I I, I don't need to. 
but but you telling me nobody can makes me want to do it. Exactly. All right, we got a lot more to get to here. It's it, we got to get to the whip around here. Uh, Nada, let's just get right to it. Can we get a word from our partners, please? The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute, getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. Ready, set, Vegas. All right, dead leg. A yeah. lot of stuff happened yesterday in the world of college basketball. Let's start the whip around with yeah. where you spent your afternoon, and that was at the dunk watching – Providence and Georgetown and Ed Cooley's first trip back to the building in which he used to call home. Yeah. Seemed like an incredible environment. Interesting pregame comments from man. Interesting postgame comments from man. You walk us through it. Um, yeah, Providence wins 84-76. You said interesting pregame comments just in case. I Did he say something? Did he tell Fox anything on the broadcast that I was not aware of, or is there just something I'm missing there? It was just about... You know, he talked to his guys about what this was going to be like, but they've been on social media and, and they understand. It was just the whole set. I don't know how much of the video you saw of him just not walking onto the court because I know you saw that, but like walking into the building, you okay. know, shaking the, the people who do. Yeah, you know what it's like to go into an arena that you're familiar with, like the people who scan your bag, you know them, yes. the people who hand out, you know, like you, you see faces when you walk into that building that you you see them every time you walk into that building and for ed to come back in uh, that is one where it's very easy for providence fans who maybe took a selfie with ed cooley once but don't really know him didn't really spend time with them you just liked his basketball team and liked him as your basketball it's very easy for those people to be like boo ed cooley but like the people who he was he interacted with every day when he walked into the building those are the first faces he saw and i i just enjoyed seeing the smile on his face and the smile on their faces i know it was wild when he got into the bowl of the arena but when he was That's just right. you know behind the scenes um I, I i thought i i just liked seeing him smile at familiar faces and familiar faces smile back shake his hand give him a hug tell him like there was a man who literally said hey it's good to see you i i like that yeah, there was a lot more of that in the post game uh, after the press conference, which I'll get to. But, uh, you know, I did a walk and talk with him back to the locker room with a few other reporters. But as we did it, normally you do that with the coach, get a little extra material. And uh, it's just it's, it's a walk from point A to point B. This was a walk from point A to point B uh, with about eight stops along the way with people that knew Ed. So this is after the game. Um, one guy looked to be late 50s, early 60s. Uh, borderline in tears overseeing Ed Cooley and getting to greet him. And uh, he was there with his son. They obviously had some sort of personal relationship. Um, there, then there were, this was like, he would say hello, give someone 15 to 20 seconds. We'd walk 10 feet. Someone else said hello. So like, to your point, very much a lot of that and why um, yesterday meant so much to Cooley. I have a, a story obviously up at cbsports.com on the CBS Sports app. We will link it in the pod description so you can read it. Um, let me try and be brief with the recap so we can get to the rest of the stuff as, as well. Because this was Providence, Georgetown. Providence might be in the tournament. Georgetown's not a good team. But holy hell, what a scene. Um, and unlike anyone we'll get in the sport the rest of the season, obviously, I uh, as 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 the moment grew nearer and uh, we knew Ed Cooley was going to walk out of that uh, tunnel, out of that vomitorium, and the media started to assemble around it, um, I was uh, I was walking with John Fanta and I was like, can you I can't remember there ever being a situation where like, you know, you'd have this cluster of folks that are on the court waiting for a coach to. Now, it might have happened on the court when Patino returned to Kentucky. That was, by the way, in 2001. Um, but <laughs> the moment actually reached uh, uh, for me, I actually I, I, I had a quick laugh because Georgetown's team came out first and we're, you know, we're at the I don't know, under five point to uh, to to tip off or whatever and the and the national anthem so they come out they come out and i'm i'm off to this like i'm on the court but i'm not in the way but there's like a good pair there's like a good seven eight media people camera people that are and so like the georgetown players come out and they're going through their final layup lines and shoot arounds and so they're like trying to do it and the media's in the way and they got guys going like oh man get out of the way get up what are we doing it and so i'm cracking up because i'm like this never happens like this like 
I, I was appreciative that the media was allowed to get that moment. And there was a lot of security there. I reported the actual specific numbers um, from the venue. But for that particular moment, security actually let it happen. But they probably should have moved the horde like cattle just a little bit more. It was just I was cracking up because I was like, these dudes can't even get, can't even get through their final layup line without media uh, in their way. And then Cooley finally comes out and the noise, the noise and the booing when this happened. And then I didn't see this um, when they introduced him. I was back at my seat, so I didn't have a good eye on, on Cooley. But the uh, public address announcer introduces the team. And then it's and the head coach of the end before he can even finish, he is drowned out by the loudest boo of the night when that happened. And then apparently Cooley, when that happened, uh, he was just he, he started laughing and smiling because he got it like he leaned into it. And it was uh, it was it turned into a pretty damn good game. Georgetown actually put it in doubt. And then, oh, boy, Devin Carter, my, oh, my, oh, my program legend, man, with what he was able to do and the performance he put on a one man, seven, nothing run. That was part of a larger 11, nothing run that that clinched the game with about two minutes to go. The game was in doubt. Carter finished with 29 points, four rebounds, four steals. Um, that was awesome. The fan, I want to speak to Providence fans here um, the, with the exception of a chant that I'm not going to repeat here, uh, which was completely inappropriate. Um, horns down. No, yeah, there you go. They started, Providence fans started chanting horns down at Ed Cooley, and it Let got real uncomfortable. You, they would never, ever, ever make anyone take down a horns down shirt in that building, ever. Um, but there was one chant that was completely uncalled for, um, and I don't know if it was, it was, la- it was definitely loud. It was in the, fr- they did it twice. They did the first time they did it in the, fr- in the opening minutes of the game. I wonder if it was loud enough that the, that the cameras could pick it up and I'm not going to say it here. Um, and then I, I counted it from, from the time the game tipped until the end, there were 12 and even does an F Ed Cooley chant, some louder than others. Um, but the fans did behave themselves. No one threw anything. I talked with the AD before the game. He said, if we catch one person, throw anything. We've got more cameras in this building than we've ever had before. We've had d- more than double security than we've ever had. They get thrown out. They're going right to jail. Right to jail. And uh, the fans lived up to expectations. They were lunatics. They were delirious. They mocked Ed Cooley. But no one went over the line. No one was uh, unruly. And I thought that was a key thing. One of the key things, GP, was that the fans played their role. And Ed Cooley, and trust me, the, the guy as usual gave, <laughs> there's just too many quotes, Ed. Like, can you dial it down, please? Uh, he's, he handled it so well after, after the fact. And it was uh, an incredible environment. And uh, I, I got a couple more things, but I don't want to model uh, too long. What, uh, what were your thoughts? Um, well, first, I just think it's funny. It, it's, it's interesting how we move the bar, the goalpost, for standards of behavior in sports, because you said the fans were on their best behavior. There were 12 F Ed Cooley chains. Correct. Correct. <laughs> you said about, those things back to back. We're talking about Providence. Here. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. it's like, can you imagine in any other workplace? Oh yeah. Everybody was super cool and respectful. Yeah. They chanted F Matt Norlander 12 times, but beyond, <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. But that, but that's sports. And I get it. I just think yeah, it's funny. For sure. Um, I, I, it's just never lost on me that in every other aspect of life or, or pretty much every other aspect of life, if a person does so well at one job that they get an opportunity to take a bigger and better job. And most people, if you'll play along, believe that Georgetown is a bigger and better job than prop. I, that's just what most people think. Yes. Um, most people, when they take a bigger and better job that they were offered because they were so good at this other job. Typically we understand why they accept it and we congratulate them when they do it. But in folk in sports, folks just disregard all normal standards of behavior. Like I get being disappointed that your coach left. I get being disappointed that these good times you've had aren't going to continue. What I don't get is questioning somebody's character because they change jobs. I don't get that. Like that doesn't happen in any other as or, or I, I should say very few other aspects of life. Um, I'm just capable of looking at these men as men with careers, just like you and I are men with careers. And so I don't spend much time getting mad at anybody uh, for doing what they believe is is best for them and their families as it pertains 
to turning down a job or accepting a job. Um, I know I'm in the minority. I know I'm not changing how Providence fans feel. I'm not even trying to. Mm -hmm. It's just I, you'll never see me upset with a man or woman in sports taking a job that they feel like is in their best interest to take at this point. I can I can remove yeah. whatever emotion from it and just say there I've had to make career decisions before and they've sometimes been tough and I just do what I think is best for me and my family and I don't get mad at Ed Cooley or anybody else for doing the same. It's the tribalism of sports at uh you know. Oh I know you know. I'm just saying. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I know. I know. And, and and one last thing I was going to say, and then we'll move on. You mentioned um, at Providence, outside of the verbal stuff, nobody crossed the line. They made it clear before the game. Hey, if you throw something, these are your words. If you throw something on the court, you're going straight to jail. Well, remember last week we were talking about court stormings. Yeah. People are like, how do you stop them? You just you you do that. Well, well, you they, make it very clear. If you do this, this is what will happen, and you enforce it. But just, there were there were. 11 police officers in the building. Providence wasn't going to storm anyway. Uh, but, you know, if 11 police officers try and arrest like 500 people, you'll get, you'll get, you'll, 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 st you'll stop some, but you're not going to stop everyone. But I know. I, I just, my, my point is simple. Yeah. They said, don't do this or this will happen. And it seemed believable. And so nobody did it. Yep. I, I think that's a pretty good, uh, no, it was it was yeah. it was good. Before we continue, just a couple things from Cooley. What uh, what he said at the press conference, and then uh, what he said in the with the with the small gaggle of reporters out there. Um, he sat down at the presser, and uh, after saying that it feels like mass in here, and I needed Jesus today, he said, "All right, let's address the elephant in the room." And he had probably like a ooh, three minute monologue um, where he just an opening statement there. And uh, I'll paraphrase some of this, but he was like, I'm not the coach of Georgetown without Providence and, and everyone that was here. He name checked a lot of people. Um, he did not apologize at all for leaving. I, I asked him directly, uh, do you, would you have changed anything about the way, not that you left, Ed, but the way that you left the timing, he said not a single thing whatsoever. Um, and I thought that was notable because I think some Providence fans were, were looking for that. Uh, a couple of quotes from him in that, uh, in, in that, press goggle he said it wasn't easy to leave guys it wasn't not even a little bit you feel and see what you saw that shit's real and i mean you've got to treat people the right way and people think of who what why where when it's none of their business um he said i'll always be a part of the fabric i'll always be a part of this uh culture of this university and the reason i made a business family decision to move on many don't have the courage the courage and he was really impassionate uh, when he said this to change uh, because you're content and just want the status quo um he also told me that he thinks that eventually this schism, because it is a rivalry between Providence and Georgetown now, but it more than, but really it's more of a, it's a one way schism between a city, a fan base and a man. And he told me it'll be repaired in time. You can't erase history. So for all the good that was done and somebody leaves and it's a negative way, the good will always outweigh the bad. It's just not the right time. Now you can't erase history. We did what we did and we did it together. You feel me. Um, he just does not has has no regrets about how he did. It. Now this is not going to say well with Providence fans because they just are not buying that Cooley made the decision the way he did as quickly he did. They thought he had angles on doing this for months and uh, they just they're, they're not okay with how it ended. But to hear Cooley, he's like, listen, man, my parents still live in this city. My son's here. Like a part of me is still here. Will always be here, and it's going to take time. He believes that there that, that there will be eventually one day, probably after. He's done coaching at Georgetown because he's not someone you're going to find coaching at 70. It's just not going to happen. Like Cooley's going to be at Georgetown, in my opinion, because we talked about this before, um, even when he was at Providence. He doesn't see him self-coaching long past the age of 60. So he thinks on some level, you know, be it 10 years from now, like they'll they'll be a warmer. And he might well be right. Um, I thought yesterday was a was a necessary uh, moment of catharsis for the fan base. They did what they did. Um, they needed to get it out. Next year will be a little bit better, I'm sure, uh, but it won't be all better. And for to hear Cooley talk, I thought it was actually something of a cleansing for him as well. Um, just not running from it, man. It wasn't uncomfortable. It was emotional for him. Uh, it wasn't uncomfortable for him yesterday. I'll say that. That was one of my biggest takeaways. The man was not uh, out of place in that arena. And... Uh, for him to be on the opposite side of such a big moment for Providence, I thought that was pretty intriguing. Um, appreciate Ed for the time he uh, the time he gave, and uh, yeah, he's just not gonna be. He's just not gonna. He's not walking anything back, and he's he's mentally at a place that he thinks a lot of Providence fans will eventually get to. Uh, it might take him two years, five years, ten years. Some might might not ever get there, 
but I thought that whole uh, that whole thing was uh, was intriguing. We can move on. Well, we're... well, you you make a good point about he looked comfortable or didn't look uncomfortable. If you remember Chris Beer going back to Texas Tech for the first time, he looked uncomfortable. He did look uncomfortable. And just quickly on that, yeah. uh, Jeff Goodman, our, our buddy, he was at both of these. He said definitely the Texas Tech Texas game for the course of the game. Like Providence fans were on him consistently. He's like, no, no, the level of verbal hostility, uh, uh, like it, that one was worse than this one. And this one was, was, was pretty up there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Ed looked comfortable. Um, I thought he, ha- I'm with you. I thought he handled it the right way. He said the right stuff. He complimented Kim English, which I thought Big was, time. yeah. And I thought that's good. A lot. Yeah. And honestly, I think Kim can play a role in helping shape how Providence fans feel about Ed going forward. You know, they, both those men can play a role in how this goes. It will not get fixed or repaired overnight what what and and just like i i i don't disagree with you that pro, some providence fans are upset with the way it happened i it's just my experience with these things is that that is something fans often say was well, just the way he did it. it but it really is always just he did it mm-hmm. like i guess there's good ways and bad ways to do things and and better ways and worse ways to do things but ultimately no matter how it went down, I think Providence fans would feel exactly about Ed Cooley the way they feel about Ed Cooley today. If you tell Providence fans, hey, how did you want Ed Cooley to do this? And they lay it out for you. And yeah. then you say, okay, let's pretend that he did it that way. How you feel? They'd still be mad. Um, yeah. But I do think that will that that anger and hurt and disappointment and whatever else, it'll go away over time. Nolan Richardson goes back to Arkansas all the time as recently as last night and was in his celebrated. His name's on the court. Was- that was and that was as ugly as it gets. Yeah. That was Nolan Richardson saying, if you want to fire me, fire me. And they were like, okay. And yeah. then they fired him. And then he sued them. Yeah. Obviously and, not the same situation, but, no, 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 no. So, but my point is there was a point where Nolan Richardson, I promise you, never thought he'd step foot in Arkansas on Arkansas's campus again. Mm-hmm. And there was a point where Arkansas was like, F that guy. And now his name's on the court. Eventually we'll get there. But it might take time. I yeah. mean, it is 2024. John Calipari left Memphis in 2009. If he tried to come back to Memphis tonight and right. be honored, he would get booed inside FedEx Forum. Yeah, and we, I, we don't need to keep burrowing down this. But as you well know, um, Cooley and Calipari are wired so differently. So some of it's got to yes. be on the guy as well. Yes. Yes. He's, not that, he's not that guy. I will, uh, and then we will move on. I, the quote that I uh, tagged my, my tweet to, to share with, obviously Providence fans <laughs> We're taken aback by it. Uh, Cooley said, quote, this is him explaining why he left and why he has no regrets. Last time I checked, we have a democracy. Last time I checked, (laughs) slavery ended years ago. Nobody (laughs) owns me and I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. And that's okay. period. Um, The quote is the quote. He said it. He also said it with like in typical Cooley, like um, I'm going to just lay it to you, frankly, but like with 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 a smile and and with a laugh here. He's like, I'm 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 doing what I got to do. Like I did what I did and I'm I'm not apologizing for it. And, uh, and, and no one's going to hold me back from, from doing this kind of stuff. And, um, and when, when he said, when he said that, I was like, all right. Yeah. That's one where if I were his editor and we were planning all this, I'd have said, I said, all right, I I know what you're saying. Let's leave that out. I know. But he, but he did. And it's fine. Like, that's the way he feels. It's fine. That's that's a quote that will absolutely be. Oh, I can't like, I, like I would not have said that, but I also can understand how you'd get so caught up in the moment where you say something like that, because think about what this man has been dealing with since March self-inflicted. I get it. But like, I mean, he did what he did and the reaction is the reaction. And I'm sure on some level he knew what the reaction would be, but this man has put up with a lot. I mean, it's ugly, ugly. I don't, I can't, most of us will never, ever, ever understand what it's like Mm -hmm. to be as big of a deal in Providence Mm -hmm. as Ed Cooley was yes, and to be hated in your hometown Mm -hmm. as much as Ed Cooley now is most of us either for better or worse. Most of us have no concept for what that must feel like to be that loved in your hometown. And then that hated in your hometown in the same lifetime, but that is Ed's experience. And I I can't imagine it's been easy. Yeah. And it's just another, uh, another thing for the big East, which is to me continues to remain the most interesting league in the country, not the best league, but the most interesting. There's so many things about it. Oh, by the way, in a couple of weeks here, uh, not the same exact thing. Rick Pitino will make his return, a former Providence coach as well. I uh, don't expect nearly the, um, the, <laughs> the scene there, but that will be interesting too. Uh, on the Big East note, Villanova. Horns down. Oh, yeah, horns down. For They're going to hit. That's I want Providence fans to hit Patino with horns down. Okay. Nova lost that Butler in three overtimes, as I was writing um, 
Uh, Fanta was there and he, he had the game up. Uh, three overtimes, man. Nova loses again. Uh, ninth in the Big East. Butler gets an important win. Um, important for its its own tournament hopes. We'll, we'll wait and see on that. But we're, we've hit a point here. Uh, in the Big East, uh, UConn plays obviously later on. Uh, later on today, Marquette got a win against Seton Hall, and so Seton Hall lost again. The standings, like after UConn, is just it's just a muddled mess here. Butler's now five and five in the league. Villanova is four and five. Uh, Wildcats eleven and nine overall. Um, it's again that resume is super weird because they had like the Maryland win is looking better Parish. the Texas Tech win is aging amazingly for Nova they've got a win over Carolina the Memphis one is still good they won at Creighton like they've got some stuff there but at a certain point you got to have a significant more number of wins and losses and right now they're 11 and 9 and now staring down home games against Marquette and Providence any thoughts on Nova Butler well even worse than losing is you losing when you're up 11 with 424 to go in regulation or up eight. Oh my gosh. They were up eight with 231 left. Eight. I think that is a house of horrors. I, I believe Nova's lost four of its past five games. And I know Nova fans listening knows. I think they've now lost four or five in Hinkle. So there's some sort of weird voodoo going on there too. Um, Like you mentioned 11 and nine, four and five in the big East, five and six in the first two quadrant. They have three quadrant, three losses, St. Joe's Drexel Penn. Like, they're just not – they do have some big wins. But That's what I'm saying. They've but got, their resume is banged up, buddy. It's – it's, uh, And I you keep know. waiting for them to, like, well, you know, they'll they'll figure it out. Remember last season it was like, well, when they get Justin Moore back, they'll figure it out. When they got Justin Moore back, they never really figured it out. Yeah. And this season it's like, well, you know, they'll get it straight. They're not getting it straight. Like, it's just – it's in a bad – Villanova basketball is in a bad place right now. I don't think – I don't think Cal Neptune's had any. I don't think there's job pressure on him right now, but there's fan pressure on him right now. Like there, I, I, I know Villanova fans who are starting to question: Did we get this thing wrong? Yeah, I think that's been a question for some since last season. Um, I would agree with you. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, fan pressure more than job pressure. Although if it really craters, then we'll we'll circle back and try and figure that out. Um, let's hop to the uh, the other side of the country here because um, not as in our notes here. He says he has a video Utah State. Utah State is 18. We talk about Grant McCaslin, National Coach of the Year. Uh, if Danny Sprinkle only gets two regular season losses, Utah State going to lose again? They Never. won at Boise State 90-84. to 84. Um, I didn't see this. I know in Colorado State, blue, like an 11-point lead with 50 seconds to go at Wyoming. Yeah, you can't lose to the – I got to get Colorado State out of the top 25 and one today. You can't keep – these good Mountain West teams, they're goofing around a little too much and losing to the bad Mountain West teams. Yeah, I don't have about enough of that. Horns down. Not a uh, listen. I don't. Uh, this is some. Pre- <laughs> OK, <laughs> now. Now I'm saying that. horns down to the Mountain West. Good teams that keep losing to the Mountain West. Bad teams. Horns down to you, sir. Nada says he's got video on this stuff. I don't know what this is. I don't know if GP knows, but Nada, go ahead and play what you got because uh, because I didn't see it, whatever whatever you got here. So 1.8 seconds to go. Griffin, the lob to Walters. Walters for the time. It's good. seconds to go three-point game scott baseball pass stevens with a chance at the buzzer to tie he missed it he missed it wyoming beats colorado state that's horns down good. to you that's that's and i think colorado state was up five with five seconds to go man that's a toughie that is a toughie there utah state though Good on them. 18 and Raise two. your hand if you've got Utah State in the top 10 of, of the top 25 and one. Well, only some of us have a top 25 and one. Look at you, though. Yeah, it's something, man. Aggies. They're six and two in the first two quadrants. Both losses in quadrant one. So no losses outside of quadrant one. They only have one quadrant one win. That's not great. But six and two in the first two quadrants with no losses outside of quadrant one is terrific. They got to be... Let me check this real quick. They got to be top 10 and, and wins above bubble. I'm going to check right now. Hold on. They got to be. I'd be stunned if they aren't with an 18 2 new record at this point. Utah State wins above bubble. There we go. Number nine overall. That's how good they've oh, done. Oh, and I didn't even know that. But do you want to know where Utah State is in the top 25 and one? Number nine. Number nine. nine. Number nine. Horns up to me. Nine. How about that? Good on Utah State. Uh, Nada, go ahead and um, play this uh, play this Utah State-Boise State thing you got here because he's got that as well. 
Dribbling it up, gonna go right at the bucket, gets the layup with 1.3 seconds to go. Here goes Roddy Anderson. As the clock expires, oh. we'll have overtime. And Utah State getting one of the biggest and hardest in the Mountain West Conference as Roddy Anderson misses the three, and Utah State does it. They come into Boise, Idaho, and upset the Broncos in overtime, 90-84 the final. That love that to the play-by-play -play person, and yes. his name escapes me. I apologize. Okay, I love that he recognized that was a ranked team beating an unranked team, but it was also an upset. Most people don't get that for whatever reason. <laughs> they'll see a ranked team lose to an unranked team, and they'll say, "Ooh, it's an upset." But Boise State was favored in that game. Utah State won the game as the ranked team against the unranked team, but that was also an uh, that was also an upset. Horns up, horns up to that play-by-play -play announcer. Horns up, uh, horns up, Aggies. By the way, um, horns SEC. Up Aggies. Real quick, qu quick tour around the SEC. Um, uh, Kentucky won at Arkansas. They didn't have D Rob Dillingham. You get a road win, you'll take it. Devo Davis has stepped away from the program. Musselman didn't offer anything afterward in the post game. Mississippi State beat Auburn. Auburn uh, now has lost two in a row. That's a good win. Mississippi State, they, they squeaked into the dance last season. And just, it, again, we get these, these teams every single year where like they don't really have a lot of high-profile games for whatever reason. But you look up and they're in the dance. Mississippi State could be one of those teams. Um, we'll also mention that Florida got to win another over. How many damn overtime games did we have yesterday? Florida won 102-98 against Georgia, and they blew like a 21-point lead late. I didn't see any of that. But uh, but caught a little bit of chatter about it online. That's actually a Florida, just like Mississippi State. We could have two SEC teams that wind up squeaking in there. I thought that was a big win for the resume. They obviously have more work to do there. And then Alabama now sits atop the uh, the SEC standings with a six and one record because Auburn lost. Um, in addition to that, so any quickie uh, takeaways on what you saw or just doings in the SEC GP? Um, you know, Auburn is is developing into this this interesting case study they have uh incredible computer numbers but they refuse to win a quad one game they can't win a quad they one refuse game. to do it they're just not going to do it they're zero and three now in quadrant one they've now lost back-to-back -back games but like i i noticed this as as the top 25 and one fluctuates it often fluctuates based on the schedule not the quality of the team it's the schedule. like people might look up and go god auburn they won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven straight games. And now they've lost two straight. Have they oh my God, are they starting to fall apart? No, they had to go play at Alabama and at Mississippi State. In the eleven games that they won in a row, they didn't have to do anything like at Alabama and at Mississippi State. So they won all those. Then they had to go at Alabama. They were underdogs, lost. At Mississippi State, tough game against likely NCAA tournament team, hostile environment, lost. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Next up, they get Vanderbilt. I bet they win. Not I a get, I, one bet, game. <laughs> I bet they get back to their winning game. Okay. Next Saturday at Ole Miss, quad one opportunity. What are we doing? We'll see on that. Ole Miss pulled out a win itself against AM on uh on Saturday and and might have been that might have been ships passing in the night with Ole Miss uh working its way to a tournament bid in AM. Not getting all there, although I haven't forgotten what you told me earlier in the week where AM was tied with for a Q1 W's in this in this league. There, um, we we shall see. We'll probably put that game as a uh, as one to pick for the final four and one. I got two more results for you on the whip around before we get to the uh, trivia the time. Okay, go ahead. Who now leads the SEC in quadrant one wins? I, I dude, I have no idea. <laughs> Still Texas A&M. Is it? Is it? Stop! <laughs> Texas A&M has four. That's the most in the league. Didn't lose any by nature of the results. Okay. Yeah, exactly. How about that? Um, Arizona, two more Two more to, to touch well, on. Well, people say South Carolina ain't played anybody. They have three. They have three quarter one wins. South Carolina. South Carolina. I like better. the way people say South Carolina. South Carolina. I like the way. I like, my favorite state to pronounce is South Carolina. South Carolina. I like uh, South Carolina. I about that. Horns up South, South Carolina. South Carolina. Um, Favorite state to pronounce? South Carolina. Mm. Massachusetts. Yeah, Massachusetts is up there. Massachusetts is a good one. Uh, I don't know. I kind of like uh, I like Kentucky. I like the, I like the, I like Kentucky. the pop. Kentucky. Yeah. Kentucky. 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 Yeah. Uh, it's a good one there. Uh, two more to get to, and then we'll do a look ahead. 
Uh, we, we, now let's we, pronounce states for about 10 more minutes. <laughs> amazing podcasting. We're already running late here. Uh, Arizona. Boy, I got this one wrong. I think you had zone in the final four and one, though. So kudos to you. I was <laughs> Samson. I, I was way off. 87-78. Arizona goes and gives Oregon its first home L of the season. Arizona had not won in the woods since 2015. Caleb Love, hello. 36 points, 12 of 18 shooting, hit five trays in this. And it's a good bounce back after Arizona lost by three at Oregon State just a couple days before. These schools are now tied. Your Wildcats and Ducks atop the Pac-12 standings. Uh, Tommy Lloyd refuses to lose back-to-back games. Still has never happened in his tenure there. Uh, Good win for Arizona. Oh, by the way, UCLA beat USC. USC might finish in the bottom two in the Pac-12. And then one more result here. Richmond beat Dayton. Richmond, 69. Nice. Over number 16, Dayton, 64. Flyers were on a 13-game winning streak. That is done. Uh, First loss since mid-November for them. And uh, Richmond is now the first-place team in the A-10. Spiders have won 10 in a row. They had not won. This is per Richmond. This is a wowsy. A wowsy. First trivia time. Okay. Last time Richmond won 10 in a row was what year? I'll give you within five years, and it's a right answer. Yeah, that was, um, if I remember correctly, it feels like that was uh, 1998. Just a little off. 19... Seven, no, 1935. Yeah, 1935 was the last time Richmond won 10 in a row. I remember that. I remember my papa telling me about that. Yeah, 11 at a home this season for their for Chris Mooney's Spiders, and um, it's the longest single season home win streak in school history. Good on uh, Richmond. That's a good thing for the A10 because if Dayton doesn't take another, doesn't take a bad loss, this isn't a bad loss. I don't know if it's Q1 GP. Let me check this net ranking real quick right right here this morning. Right now, Richmond is, that's a Q1 loss for Dayton. 69th, nice, in the net. And uh, and if the A-10 wants any chance of being a two-bid league, Richmond and Dayton got to pull away from the pack. Bonnies are kind of there, but like Dayton hosts Bonaventure next Friday. Got to win that game. Um, but that was a, that was a good result for the A10, and that is we got more from the weekend, but uh, we'll squeeze it into the look ahead here. Yeah, I think I do think it's possible for Richmond to build an at-large resume. Um, it will be difficult, but it's possible. Like they could get there. Um, so yeah, it it could set up where the A10 has two legitimate at-large candidates, but I I still think the best uh, the most likely scenario where the A10 gets two bids would be. Dayton at large, somebody else win league tournament. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I think so. Unless Richmond really gets it rolling and Dayton, you could, there's a potential where Richmond wins the auto bid, Dayton loses in the title game, and it could still be there. But it's, it's, at least yeah. it's on the table. I think they needed this result. Yeah. To get a possibility. It was a nice win. And listen, it snaps Dayton's winning streak. It will slide Dayton down in the top 25 and one AP poll, computers, whatever. But um, it's, it's a quad one loss on the road. It's not that big of a deal. Doesn't hurt you that much. Agreed. Let's uh let's look ahead to the next few days. All right. But first, what? before we peek ahead, partner? Come on, partner. Partner. If you need the sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. All right, dead leg. Looking ahead to the next couple of days. Uh, Monday, not great. Houston at Texas. Not bad. <laughs> horns up, I guess. Is it horns up or horns down? Well, I mean, it's at Texas, so there'll be horns up and in the in the building there. If I were Kelvin Sampson, I'd walk in just like this. <laughs> if I were Jamal Shed, I'd walk in just like this. <laughs> you did this to yourself, Texas. Just so I know. want to. I I want horns down to replace booing as the universal sign of disapproval. What if it does? What if we can peek twenty five years into the future and it's completely over? Just overtaking the American like like yeah. Instead of like like if somebody cuts you off in traffic in the year two thousand twenty four, middle finger, it's horns down. You'd middle finger, but going forward, it's just horns down to people. It'd yeah. be like, hey, you cut me off. Oh, you my cut God. me off, you son of a bitch. <laughs> horns be- down to you. Horns down. <laughs> it is a good game. Houston at Texas. I that can't wait. Right. Duke at Virginia Tech. 
That and Virginia Tech has sometimes been a little bit of a of a spooky palace for uh, for the Blue Devils. Let's talk Duke Clemson here. I did not catch this game. Um, Duke beat Clemson. Uh, Brad Brownell afterward, he actually closed his media availability by saying this quote: "I've been in I've been here in the same situation about four times with the possession, and I haven't won one yet. We got to one second, had it taken from us." End quote. And I and he got up and uh, and left after that. Nada has the video. Of the semi-controversial call in question, Nada. Let's let's see it here. He hits number one to tie the game. And everybody holding their breath here. He makes the pair. Duke leads 72-71. Gerard trying to get it in. Long pass, knocked around, and Duke cradles it, and they win the ball game. 72-71. The final today at Cameron Indoor. All right, that wasn't the foul. That was the free throws. That yeah, I was about to say that did that didn't look kind. Of, that looked pretty straightforward to me. <laughs> that looked straightforward. Okay, Proctor got fouled at the end of the game. I didn't have a problem with the foul to be honest. Uh, but if you're Clemson and you try and go in this building and you just continue not to be able to get it done, I totally, I totally get it. Um, but Proctor hit it. Proctor's been playing well as of late, by the way. And then Jared McCain had 21 points, five rebounds in this one. Uh, it did reinforce this idea that the AC, like, can Clemson go in and get a Q1 win against Duke and help um, the non Duke, non UNC teams from a resume standpoint? You still haven't gotten that. You got a little bit of that. Do um, you have any takeaways on, uh, on what will happen down there in Durham? I will just say that um, end of game fouls that lead to a change of score that leads to a different winner are almost always controversial they're almost always the right call too yeah often yeah yeah i mean i, I would say more often than not they're the right call yeah. they, then we get into a debate about well do you really want to call that right in that moment like that those are always the debates it's rarely you rarely hear anybody say there's no way that was a foul because it almost always was yeah good uh good escape there dukes had a couple of those um if, and you know they they didn't escape against Pitt or whatever, but uh, keep an eye on the Blue Devils. They've they've they they seem to be capable of a lot of different kind of stuff here. Beating almost anyone in the country or taking a loss they shouldn't take. Uh, they escaped Clemson there. Now they're on the road against Virginia Tech on Monday night. Um, if they're the team that they want to believe they are, and Duke fans think they are, and and what they were projected, uh, they walk in to Castle and uh, they don't they don't keep it close. But easier said than done. What do we got on Tuesday, G? South Carolina. South Carolina. At Tennessee, oh, ooh, that's uh, that's okay. So that's a game. I would be surprised if South Carolina can keep it within six or seven. But if they can, then all the more so. Uh, reputation uh, verified. But uh, Tennessee seems seems set up to to win that one. Dalton Connect continues to be. He's he's averaging like forty seven points a game in the past like six. He he's like, awesome. I do like. I've seen some tweets going around like, who's better than Dalton Connect? Like Zach, Zach Eady. Like, so like, like, can we do, just, like, can we just, can't we talk about Don Connect without yeah. trying to make it into something that, that Let's is not? Just appreciate him for what he's doing. Yes. Like, like, how about this? Who's going to join Zach Eady and Don Connect on an All American team? I RJ. like that conversation. RJ but Davis. when the, but when it starts with who's better than Don Connect, I'd be like, uh, I, I have, uh, buzz in, buzz. Who yeah. is Zach Eady? Is yeah. that how you do it on Jeopardy? Uh, they they don't say buzz, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say buzz was, if I ever went on Jeopardy. How they would say it, yes. If I ever got on Jeopardy, I would just go buzz. I would I would verbalize buzz. I wouldn't, uh, and then I would go horns down. <laughs> every would, time somebody, every time I missed one, I'd go horns down. I think now you're you have uh, stumbled into uh, South Carolina at Tennessee. South Carolina might be ranked. Might be. Might be ranked. Uh, Marquette at Villanova. Oh, buddy, if they ever. Yeah. They need one. They do. They, they do. need one. Yep. Texas Tech is at TCU. Mm -hmm. That should be great. That's uh, Texas Tech trying to keep uh, top of the Big 12 status. Yes, absolutely. They've been, they've been good on the road, as we discussed, but at TCU, um, mm -hmm. we've seen good teams lose there. Uh, Oklahoma at Kansas State, Octagon of Doom. It's a good Tuesday night. Hope Oklahoma doesn't put any people behind Kansas State's bench. Sure. Yeah, keep an eye. Keep an keep eye. An eye. Keep, yeah. keep, be on the lookout for that. Yep. San Diego State at Colorado State. That's a good one, man. Every week with the Mountain West. That's an, now, now that is an urgent game 
for Colorado State. Because they slipped like like now the best teams in the Mountain West in the standings have sort of separated from Colorado State. Correct. Yes. Colorado State had the best first six weeks of the season in that league. And now they're like fifth or sixth in the pecking order. Um, there's been a there's been a switch there. We'll see if they can get it going. You've also got Illinois at Ohio State. Uh, Ohio State can wrap on this, I guess. Got dropped 83 to 58 by Northwestern. So congrats to Northwestern. You're going to dance for the third time ever. I'm convinced of that. Northwestern's going to be going to the NCAA tournament. The Buckeyes have lost, and the game was at NU. Ohio State has lost 13 straight road games, man. They're one and five in their past six after starting 12 and two. Holtman's job might be in trouble. New AD coming in. We'll see on that. I think he's got a decent buyout number, though. I don't have it off the top of my head there. Ohio State's got the game at home against Illinois. And of everything that we just mentioned, there is no team that is facing a, a bigger must win. And, and that includes Villanova, as far as I'm concerned, than Ohio State at home against Illinois Tuesday night. Yeah, like this has gotten worse than I thought it would get. And it seems to be sliding further the wrong direction. If you're Chris, yeah, I don't know that his job's in – if I – I'd be on the phone with my agent being like, "Is any, what's out there? Okay. Wouldn't you? Uh I mean, you're just trying to get to Paul. I mean, <laughs> I, mean that's, I don't know what's I don't know what's yeah. happening. It's, it's it's a weird spot for Holtman because he's got a, his resume is pretty good. The resume is great. The last two years are bad. Yeah, a little a little little hit or miss, and so like, uh, yeah, uh, we'll we'll wait and see. I, I don't know. They they can there's still time for them to put pull it together and make the tournament. Uh, got to win at home against Illinois on Tuesday. That's a big one. So yeah, Monday's just okay. Um, Tuesday is obviously huge. And then we'll just uh, listen because of uh, family stuff was scheduled here on Sunday. That's why we went early. Um, we do technically later on today for anyone watching live or catching this quickly. Xavier's at UConn. That game starts in less than an hour here. That's the number one team in the country. Purdue plays at Rutgers at one Eastern on Fox. Um, uh, so if either of those teams lose and it's notable, uh, since I got some family stuff later and we couldn't wait for those, uh, I'll hop on and do a solo pod if it's necessary, but I don't, I expect UConn to win and Purdue has gotten knocked out at Rutgers in the past GP, uh, Purdue at Rutgers next year. If that's on the schedule, maybe, but I famous last words, I guess, whatever. But I, I, I don't think Purdue is going to be able to, uh, get taken out, uh, uh over at, uh, at Jersey Mike's arena. Oh, clip it, clip it. Purdue fans. I am so, if that clip does it. happen, I am so sorry. I've seen, I read this book before. Dude, by the way, Nevada at New Mexico, Sunday night, 10 p.m. Eastern. That's a genuinely awesome Mountain West game. Why they're playing at 10 Eastern on a Sunday after the AFC and NFC title games, I got no idea. All I know is for anyone that's in the Mountain Time Zone or West Coast, that's an amazing sports bonus for you on Sunday night. That's an awesome, awesome game. Uh, and I'll be dialed in after the football as well. So, okay. So, Lions 49ers kick off at 6.30 Eastern. Yeah. Be wrapping up right in time for Nevada, New Mexico. That's a good little Sunday you got there. This is like the best sports triple header of the year. And you got to open it with an eye on college basketball podcast. Chiefs, Ravens, Lions, Niners, Nevada, New Mexico. So you know what? Let's pick all three. No, no other shows doing. No other shows doing this. No. Okay. No. And we're doing the. We're doing. The, let's do it against the the spread right now. I'm bringing it up right. Now. Game one. Game one. Here we go. Hold on. Are we going to add them to our totals? I don't know. Should we? I think no. we should. Hey, who won this weekend? Do we even know? Does anybody Leave know? Leave well enough alone, guys. Again, <laughs> quit while you're ahead, please. Didn't have a good weekend, fella. I don't think oh. either of us did well. Although oh. we're still above 500 on the year. Well, that's Game tough. one. Hmm. CBS, it's America's most watched network. Network of stars. I once heard a man say this is the network of stars. Yep. Kansas City at Baltimore, 3 p.m. Eastern. And... Uh, I don't know. Give me a famous Raven. Uh, Lamar Ter Jackson. Terrell Suggs Field. Hmm? Terrell Suggs Field. Here we go. Hey, uh, Tony Saragusa Field. There we go. Tony Saragusa Stadium. RIP, by the way. Rest in peace. Uh, line is Ravens minus four and a half. Who you got? Have you seen all the Lamar Jackson Save Us memes? Videos? I have not. I honestly swear to God, I have not seen any. Oh, they're so funny. Yeah. From <laughs> it's like, from, is it save us from Taylor Swift? It's, it's like Brittany Mahomes and Taylor Swift, oh, okay. and it, it's like only one man can save us from these white girls. <laughs> and it's like Lamar Jackson <laughs> with the face chilled and the whole thing. It's this is a, this is this feels based on reputation like an extremely tough game to to, to pick. I'll go first. I will take Baltimore to cover four and a half here. They have been. Awesome. Awesome. 
awesome team. Lamar, the MVP, in my opinion, and the defense is high level. Uh, I almost feel like Kansas City might have an emergency. And listen, if you pick against Patrick Mahomes, uh, that you know, live with the consequences. I'm fully aware of that. But there was a stretch this season. Yeah, your your boy's going to break down some NFL here, okay? Because I'm dialed into it just as much as college hoops. There was a stretch this season where the Chiefs didn't look like a top five seven team in the NFL, and uh, and Mahomes' uh, skill position players weren't helping them out. They've been better as of late, but I almost feel like this one, Baltimore makes a real statement. Give me Ravens. Give me Ravens 31, Chiefs 20. I'm going, I'm taking Taylor Swift. I t- I'm taking, I'm going. playing as a reminder. You don't know that. They play the way they played 22. I think there's a Taylor Swift song called 22. Yeah. Uh, yeah after uh, Providence beat Georgetown yesterday. Okay. And they sing, they sing uh, Taylor Swift. That's their thing. Like all these fan bases have their different, you know, songs they play at a certain point in the game. Like Michigan's got Mr. Brightside, Wisconsin's got jump around. Providence hoops is you belong with me, Taylor Swift. Um, anyway, Taylor Swift's everywhere. No doubt. I, I watched a TMZ video. Cops were uh, flying to Jim Ursay's house because he was unconscious. Right. Okay. Taylor Swift was in the chopper. What are we saying? There? Yeah, they were just in the car going like 100 million miles per hour on the way to Jim Mercy's house. And it was like a uh, cool summer, just blasting. Okay. She's everywhere. All right. She's everywhere. I'm taking Taylor Swift 2031. Taylor Swift 31. Ravens 28. Game two, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, Fox. It's the Detroit Lions against the San Francisco 49ers on oh, Roger Craig Field. Roger Craig shouts to Tecmo Bowl. Underrated Tecmo Bowl legend Roger Craig. Niners minus seven. Uh, very rarely do you get an NFL Cinderella type college hoop story. That is the Lions. Fun. No doubt about it. Never made a Super Bowl. Were you aware of this, Parrish? Well, they, they've tried. They're trying. They, they've, they've, tried. they've done their best. It's hard. But, uh, it's hard, Deadleg. Trivia time. Before this year, was the, what was the most recent year the Detroit Lions won a playoff game? Oh, hell. Yeah. That was um this ain't no WrestleMania. You might be a little bit out of your depth there. 91. 91. Yep. So, that's what I was thinking. 91. Niners minus seven at home against the Lions. Who you got? I I I'm gonna pick with my heart. I want Detroit to win. I wanted Taylor Swift against Eminem in the Super Bowl on CBS, America's most watched network, network of stars. Man, that'd be an awesome. Any any combo actually with this with the Super Bowl is is good because you got. I actually don't think any combo is good. I no, absolutely any combo is good because the Lions are an incredible story. The Niners are a, historically a top four all time NFL brand from a winning perspective in the Super Bowl. Lamar Jackson and the Ravens uh, have played like the best team all season. You got home, Mahomes and the Chiefs. I don't think there's a bad combination. This I year. think anything out of the AFC is great. You either get Lamar Jackson or Taylor Swift. I don't care about the 49ers. Yeah, but the 49ers carry so much historical cachet. And like if I don't care about historical cachet. 49ers homes and Mon- against Montana's legacy and like, you know, is he is he approaching would he be better than Montana? Like there's there's stuff there. That's all. This is this is how I feel. You about- don't care you don't care about the 49ers, so therefore let it be let it be said so it is. Okay. This so. is uh this is how I feel about historical cachet. Horns down to it. Okay. Horns down to the 49ers. You know what, you're getting a little bit drunk with the horns down right horns now. Horns down to historical cachet. Give me Detroit against Taylor Swift plus seven. I will. I will join you. Detroit plus seven against the Niners. I'll take. I'll take San Francisco to win. Give me the Niners. Uh, we'll go twenty four. Get a weird score in there. Twenty four twenty two. San Francisco wins. And then of course game three. Mm-hmm. I got. I got to get the line here. Hold on. It's on. It's on the site. Let me. Uh, college hoops scores game three. Ten o'clock Eastern. Fox Sports One. It is uh, Nevada at New Mexico. The line here, New Mexico minus eight. Who you got? Oh, that's too big of a number, I think. 16 and four, New Mexico. Or sorry, 16 and four, Nevada at 17 and three, New Mexico. Yeah, I just think that's too big of a number against a team that plays in an arena with bats. I'll ride with you on that. Give me Nevada to cover. New Mexico to win, Nevada to cover. Yeah, that makes sense to me. New Mexico to win, Nevada to cover. I, I think, think that I think that does it. I mean, we're at an hour and twenty right now, but a Sunday a Sunday AM special. That's where you get extra long show. I guess. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. and Teagle, Legend Hook, Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening, watching.
the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. More of us than there are of them. If you're bothered by horns down, you're them. <laughs> That's true. That needs to be reflected in the comments. New challenge in the comments. Five stars and comment. If you're offended by horns down, you're them. <laughs> Hashtag us. We'll talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.